Chapter Thirteen of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Thirteen: A Near Miss. Everything all clear? Mister Brewster called out from his position at the tiller in the yawl. Easy action. Aye, aye, sir. Biff called back to his father. Biff held on to the bowline, loosely circled over a piling at the dock. Cast off, then, Tom Brewster ordered. Biff flicked the rope, snaking it over the piling, as the easy action was cleared. Biff heard the low growl of the reverse gear as his father backed easily away from the wharf. A shift to forward, the engine revved up higher, and the yawl headed out of the harbour at Hana. It was a clear night bright stars lighting up the skies over the Hawaiian islands. A slight sliver of a new moon could just be seen rising in the east. The yawl ran on its auxiliary engine for fifteen minutes, putting the harbour behind it. When they were well clear and in open sea, Mr. Brewster cut the engine. All hands too, he called. Prepare to hoist sail. A yawl is a fore and aft rigged vessel, it has a large mainmast forward, and a much smaller mast set abaft, or behind the tiller or wheel. Hank Mahanelli and his son Lee had hold of the halyards at the mainmast, ready to pull up the lines to raise the main and jib sails. Biff would handle the mizzen or aft sail by himself. Heave away, me hearties, Mr. Brewster ordered. The three hearties heaved, and the sails slid up their masts, and billowing gently out, catching a soft, warm wind. The sails were set and trimmed. OK, Biff, you take over now. Biff came back into the cockpit and took the tiller over from his father. Keep her headed as she is now. The compass setting is for Apollo Point. We ought to make it easily by daybreak, and then we'll cruise the western coast of the Big Island. Heading for Kay Dad? Biff asked. That's right, Biff. Hank and I are going to turn in now. You and Lee handle the ten to two watch. Wake us up at two, and the new boys can grab some sleep. Lee joined Biff in the cockpit. The easy action lived up to her name. She slid effortlessly through the water, noiseless except for the soft swish of her bow cleaving a path. The wind held steady. There was nothing to do but hold her on course. Like sailing, Lee? Biff asked. It's the greatest. I'll take sail over power any day, Lee spoke as if he were an old salt. Not so good for water skiing, though, Biff said. You need more speed for that. Quick speed, fast starts. Oh, sure, but for a cruise like we're taking, give me sail. The boys were quiet. The spell of the night settled over them. Lee, Biff knew, dozed off from time to time. He himself felt drowsy, lulled into sleeplessness by the slight rise and fall of the craft as it rowed over the swells. Biff looked at the luminous dial of his watch. It was nearly twelve o'clock. He nudged the sleeping Lee. Hey, you're supposed to be on this watch with me. How about taking over for a while? Lee rubbed his eyes, stretched and yawned. Aye, aye, Captain. He took the tiller. Biff stood up, stretched his body and settled into a more comfortable position. He fought off sleep, but knew he dozed now and again in short five-minute catnaps. He was never far from consciousness, though, and if anything happened, say a quickening of the wind, he would have been alert immediately. At two o'clock, a wildly yawning Tom Brewster emerged from the cabin, followed by Hank Mayanelli. All right, boys, we'll take over now, get some sleep. At this steady pace, we'll reach Apollo long before daylight. We'll drop anchor and set out again at daybreak. Apollo is the northernmost point on the island of Hawaii. Biff and Lee were asleep the moment they hit their berths. It seemed to Biff he'd only just gone to sleep when he felt his father shaking his shoulder. Rise and shine, Biff, almost daylight. We're shoving off as soon as we have some grub. Under a bright morning sun, the easy action got under way again. Biff was at the tiller. His father and Hank Mahanelli, tired from their early morning watch, dozed on the foredeck in comfortable captain's chairs.
Biff and Lee had their work cut out for them. The course set was a zigzag one. They wanted to cruise as much of the coastline as possible, in the hope of spotting some sign of Huntington's sunken sloop. Biff would head the easy action offshore, run out nearly ten miles, then tack back in. For every three miles they progressed down the coast towards Ke Lei, the southern tip of Hawaii, they covered nearly twenty miles out and back from the coast. A stiff morning breeze sent the easy action skipping briskly over the waves. They had covered a good distance by eight bells, twelve o'clock noon. Biff and Lee took turns at the tiller. When Lee was the steerer, Biff stood on the highest point of the foredeck, near the ship's bow, scanning the waters on either side with powerful binoculars. When it was his time to take over the wheel, Lee took up the vigil. They reached Kei Lue on the Kona coast as the sun, like a blazing ball, settled into the Pacific Ocean to the west. They were halfway to Kei Le, the southern cape. The party went ashore for a steak dinner at the famous Kona Steakhouse, then came back to their boat filled with food and tired. All turned in at once. No watch was set. None of them saw the black-hulled power cruiser come in and drop its anchor nearby. Then the captain of the cruiser, having spotted the easy action, weighed anchor and moved off to an anchorage out of sight from the crew of the yawl. The next morning the search was continued, the yawl weaving its way in and out along the coast, drawing near to Kay Lee, nearer to the position at which Huntington had last been heard from. "'I'll take the tiller now, Biff,' his father said. "'Hank and I will alternate. I want you and Lee to keep a constant watch. Your young eyes are sharper than ours.' The easy action spent the day crisscrossing a wide area of water between the shoreline and a distance outside the coral shoals, varying from five to twelve miles. Nightfall found them off Kay Lay, or South Cape. They anchored in thirty feet of clear water, about a quarter of a mile offshore. They could see the white combers lashing at the rocky formation of the beach. We'll combine our evening meal with a council of war, Tom Brewster said, once the ship was made tight for the night. You figure we're in the danger area now, Dad, Biff asked. Huntington Sloop is on the bottom of the ocean somewhere in this area, and Perez Soto is looking for it just as hard as we are, Hank Mianelli added. What about Dr. Weber, Biff asked. Do you think he's aboard Perez Soto's boat, or do you think he's being held on shore? Hard to say, Biff. My feeling is that he's being held on shore. A captive on a boat could be too easily spotted at a refueling wharf. Don't you think, Dad, we ought to divide up now? Biff suggested. Two of us make a shore search for Dr. Weber. The other two cruise around and try to spot the sunken sloop. Good idea, Biff. We'll do that tomorrow, Mr. Brewster agreed. Hank and I will go ashore. You and Lee conduct the sea search. That suited Biff and Lee just fine. They looked at one another and smiled. Now tonight, I don't think it's necessary to have a standing watch. There's been no sign of Perez Soto so far, but one of us ought to sleep on deck. Any volunteers? Biff's father asked. Me, Dad. Biff jumped at the chance. I'd love to. Nice warm night. The sleeping will be better under the stars than it will be in the cabin. OK, let's all turn in. Big day ahead. Biff spread out a sleeping bag on the Easy Action's foredeck. He lay on his back, his eyes staring up at the millions of stars twinkling in the sky overhead. The sound of the surf came distinctly. It was a soothing sound, and shortly Biff was lulled to sleep. Some hours later, he was awakened slowly. He heard the distant throb of a powerful engine. At first, Biff thought it must be an airplane, but then, as he became wider awake, he realized the throbbing came not from the air, but the sea. It grew louder as the craft, whatever it was, drew near. Biff sat up, propping himself on one arm. Now there was no mistaking it. A boat, one with a powerful engine, was rapidly approaching the Easy Action's anchorage. Biff stood up. He peered into the starlight night. He could see the reflection of stars twinkling on the water's surface. Then he made out the outlines of a cabin cruiser throwing a fan-tailed white wake, heading fast towards the Easy Action. Fools, Biff muttered to himself. If they don't change course, they'll ram us. He knew the white-hulled yawl was sharply outlined against the starlit waters. Then he suddenly knew what was happening. The on-charging cruiser was aiming at the yawl. It meant to ram her. Biff raised a cry. It was too late. His voice was drowned out by the roar of the cruiser's engines. Biff knew now that it was a twin-engine craft. 
Now the boat seemed on top of the yawl, its bow with a much higher freeboard than the low-lying yawl, reared up menacingly only twenty feet from the sailing craft. Surely it would crash them, ram them, and send them to the bottom of the sea, with Biff's father, Hank Mianelli, and Lee trapped below. Biff yelled. At the last moment the cruiser swerved sharply to the starboard, making an almost right-angled turn. It roared alongside the easy action, not ten feet separating the two boats. As the cruiser made its fast skidding turn, it threw up a tremendous wave. Biff saw the wave sweeping towards the yawl. Then tons of foaming water cascaded over the easy action. Biff grabbed for the mainmast, wrapping his arms round it in a death lock. He felt the wave tugging at his body. It took all his strength to prevent being swept overboard. The wave passed over, tumbling gallons of water into the cabin below. Biff released his grip on the mainmast. He sprinted to the cockpit. It was nearly filled with water. Dad, Dad, you all right? He started to plunge into the water-filled cabin and was met by his father, Hank and Lee, fighting their way out, gasping for breath, trying to expel water from their choked lungs. The black cruiser had sped away, the throb of its engines barely audible now. Everyone was all right, but what a mess. Bedding was soaked, galley equipment, pots, pans, dishes had been swept off shelves some of the pans bobbing like corks in the swirling waters inside the ship's cabin. Biff went into action. Maybe he could start the engine before the water did its damage. He splashed through the water and reached the engine compartment. He pulled open the door. It had held back the flood from the engine room. Before the water could rush in and fill up the compartment, Biff had the engine going. He quickly turned on the yawl's sea pumps. He stood there with his fingers crossed, hoping the engine wouldn't conk out. It didn't. The heavy-duty pumps worked perfectly. Already the water inside the boat was beginning to recede. Biff joined his father, Hank Mirnelli, and Lee in the cockpit. They were still dazed and only now beginning to breathe easily. I thought he was going to ram us, Dad. Mr. Brewster shook his head. I get it now, Biff continued. To ram us would have damaged his boat, put it out of commission, even if it didn't sink. He wanted to swamp us. And nearly did, Mr. Mirnelli said. The steady beat of the pumps continued. They were rapidly bailing the yawl out. Well, Biff, you know what we're really up against now, his father said seriously. I think I always did, Dad. This Perez Soto will stop at nothing. Lee sat quietly, but he was shaking as if from a chill. It was the recent frightening experience which caused him to tremble. Tom, I've been in and around water, in and out of boats all my life, but that was the nearest brush I've had with a watery grave. Hank Mahanelli's voice was solemn. He'll never get away with it, he added fiercely. The next hour was spent in straightening up the water damage. Bedding was brought on deck and spread to dry. Lee was elected cook to make coffee and hot tea. Dawn was spreading before the easy action was shipshape again. After a hot meal, Mr. Brewster took Biff aside. Biff, we're not going to let last night's incident change our plans. Hank and I are going ashore immediately. You and Lee put out and start the search at once. We've got to stop Perez Soto before he stops us. Come below with me for a moment. Biff followed his father into the cabin. He saw him open his bag. When he turned round, he was holding a revolver in his hand. You know how to use this, Biff. You've practised enough. Yes, Dad. You're not to use it except in the most extreme emergency. You're to use it only to repel anyone trying to board this boat. Biff nodded his head gravely. Mr. Brewster replaced the weapon and left the cabin to join Hank Mayanelli. Biff and Lee watched their fathers as they headed for shore in the yawl's dinghy. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Fourteen Storm. The boys watched the dinghy plunge into the surf near the shore. They saw it picked up by a breaking roller and carried on its crest to the shore. They saw the two men pull the dinghy high up on the shore and hide it behind some low spreading growth. They're taking no chances, Biff said to Lee. We've got to be equally careful. Biff's voice held a grim tone. The memory of the night before was still vivid in his mind. Lee's face was solemn too, his round brown eyes serious. 
You're the captain, Biff. Biff smiled. He didn't want Lee to become too alarmed. Okay, my friend, let's put out to sea. I can handle the mainsail and the jib. You stand by the tiller. We'll hoist the mizzen after we're heading out. Biff ran the mainsail up, leapt to the bow of the boat and started hauling in the anchor on a hand winch. It took a lot of effort. The anchor was heavy and he had to raise it 30 feet. The easy action, a spanking offshore breeze in its sail, was already ploughing through the sea before Biff had the anchor safely stowed. Once the anchor was stowed, Biff went back to the cockpit. How am I doing, Biff? Heading the right way? Lee asked. Point her a little more to the southwest. I'll raise the mizzen. Biff finished his seaman's job and dropped down in the cockpit beside Lee for a breather. I'll take over now, Lee. You go forward and be the lookout. Take the binoculars, he suggested. All morning they continued their criss-crossing course. The high noon sun blazed down on them. The heat soon dried the bedding. Biff heaved to long enough to carry the bedding below and make up the berths. They had a sandwich, then stretched out on the hot deck for a brief rest. The boat drifted. Where do you think we are now, Lee? Biff asked. Lee looked shoreward. They could just make out the coastline. I think we've rounded K. Lay. Must be just off the black sand beach. Black sand? Yes, Biff. The lava from Kiloia spilled down to the ocean. The surf ground it up into fine black powder, really finer than sand. That's why it's called the Black Sand Beach. It's all along the Puna coast, all the way up to Hilo. That's a city on the west side of the Big Island. I think we ought to change course then, head a point or two north by northeast. Then we'll wing back east and return to the anchorage. Lee was at the tiller. He came about, and the easy action was put on a long reach, pushed briskly along by a southerly wind. Toward the middle of the afternoon, Biff looked up to see Lee coming aft. Biff was at the tiller. He noticed a frown on his Hawaiian friend's face. What's up, Lee? You sight something. No, Biff, Lee shook his head. The serious expression on his face had deepened to one of worry. Then what's your trouble? You look like you got trouble, Biff smiled. I'm afraid we both may have, Lee answered. Have you noticed it getting any warmer? A little, perhaps. Wind's freshened a bit, too. That's it. I'm afraid we're in for some Kona weather. Kona weather? Yes, that's what we call a wind coming up from the equator. Sometimes it reaches gale force. Always there's heavy rain. Biff looked astern. On the southern horizon he could make out huge thunderheads. Was there a Kona wind when Huntington was lost? Yes, a big one. Then we'd better get out of here fast. We'll try to get back round K. Lai. The point ought to give us some protection. There was no doubt now that a Kona wind was catching them. Biff changed course again. He headed easy action's bow west by north. The wind rose rapidly. It whistled through the sails, making the rigging lines vibrate. The sea began kicking up. The wind drove easy action before it. The yawl heeled far over, its mainsail stretched taut on the starboard side. The yawl was fairly racing through the water. Suddenly they were struck by a torrential downpour. The rain hit the deck in drops as big as half dollars. The sky had blackened, the shore was blanked out. Angry white caps dotted the water like blobs of cotton. Take the tiller, Lee, Biff shouted above the roar of the wind and the pounding of the rain. I've got to get the mainsail down. Biff fought his way forward on the rain-slippery deck. He was pushed along by the driving wind. He reached the mainmast. Its lines were whipping against it, cracking like pistol shots. He loosened the mainsail halyard. The wind grabbed the mainsail. Biff struggled to pull it down. Suddenly there was a thunderous crack. The mainsail gave way, torn loose from its halyards. It stretched straight out like a flat white canopy and flapped violently in the wind, which was now near gale force. There was no way to cut it loose. Biff let the line go. The jibsail was still holding. 
Turning, Biff felt the rain and salt spray beat against his face. He had to bend into a crouch to make any progress aft. The salt spray stung his eyes, nearly blinding him. Once he slipped and crashed to the deck, he could feel himself sliding towards the starboard gunwale, now nearly under water, because the yawl had heeled over so far. A last-second grab at a mooring stanchion saved him from going overboard into the boiling sea. Biff pulled himself up slowly. He crawled on hands and knees and fell exhausted into the cockpit. For moments he lay there, gasping for breath. Then he saw the fear on Lee's face. Lee held the tiller in a vice-like grip. Biff rose. I'll take over, he shouted. Lee merely nodded his head in assent, glad to relinquish the wooden tiller's handle. It was a fight to hold it steady. From forward, the boys heard another crack, sharp as a shotgun shot. Jibsel's given away, Biff shouted. Now their only control of the yawl was by the mizzen sail. It was behind them, making control of the boat most difficult. If the mizzen goes, Biff yelled, we're done for. Just as he spoke the words, the mizzen gave way, torn from its halyard by a sudden driving gust. At the same moment, the boys heard a sound that sent an even greater chill of fear racing up and down their spines. It was the roar of an angry surf pounding the shore. They were being swept ashore. The boat would be dashed to bits. They would be flung on razor-sharp coral. Get forward, Lee, Biff shouted. Let the anchor go. The sound of the pounding surf came nearer. Biff prayed that the anchor would grab and hold. He fought the tiller, trying to keep the yaw from being swept ashore broadside. Then suddenly the yaw was lifted high on the crest of a roller, as if handled by a giant. Then it crashed down into a churning trough of water. Biff's grasp on the tiller was torn loose. He felt himself being hurtled through the air. Then he struck the water with a thud, knocking the wind from his lungs. Biff felt himself go under. Then he was lifted by another roller. Surfacing, he gasped for air. His arms flailed the water. The waves tossed him about, carrying him nearer and nearer the shore. Biff struggled to ride the waves to keep control of his body so that he might avoid being dashed on the shore. He was hoping against hope that this would be a sand, not coral beach. After a seemingly endless struggle, Biff, kicking out, felt his feet touch bottom. Nothing had ever felt so good before. His feet were touching a powdery sand, now roiled up, but at least it wasn't a coral bottom. Biff found himself in waist-deep water. The shoreline was only a few feet in front of him. He staggered through the surf, reaching the black sand beach, and threw himself face down on the sand. Every muscle in his body felt as it had been pounded, pummeled, pulled, and strained. Then he thought of Lee. He turned over and rose to his knees. He saw the easy action. Her anchor had caught and held. She was pounding up and down in the rough waters, but Biff could see that she was holding. But where was Lee? Biff stood up. He went to the water's edge. He walked out until the water raced against his knees. Cupping his hand to his mouth, he shouted, Lee! Lee! There was no answer. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Fifteen Men Missing Biff stood on the beach, calling out his friend's name again and again. His voice shook with effort, trying to drown out the noises of surf and sea. The wind was dying down slightly, but the surf was still too rough and too dangerous for Biff to try to reach the boat, which stood one hundred feet offshore. Biff's eyes searched the beach, hoping to spot Lee swimming ashore. No such welcome sight met his eyes. To his left, about a quarter of a mile away, Biff could see a formation of lava rock jutting out into the sea. He thought his friend Lee might have gotten to shore on the other side of the lava promontory. Biff ran down the beach. His pounding heart sank when he reached the ugly greyish-black rock stretching out into the sea. Its side was smooth, rising upward some thirty feet. 
there was no place Biff could spot where he could gain a foothold to climb to its top. Around the base of the lava cliff, the water dashed and swirled, making it impossible for Biff to swim around to the other side. Biff went back to the spot on the beach directly opposite the easy action. He sank down on the wet sand, filled with despair. He felt certain now that his good friend Lee must be lost in the ocean. Night settled over a lonely, saddened Biff. The rain had stopped. The wind was dying down. The surf was losing some of its angry roar. Sleep, a sleep Biff felt he could never attain, finally came to the tired, worried boy. With it came release for his troubled mind. By morning the wind was gone, the sea was smooth and the sky was blue over Hawaii once again. Biff saw the yawl rocking gently at its anchor, its sails torn, tattered, drooped from the mast like the banners of a defeated army. There was no sign of Lee. There was only one thing to do. He must search the nearby coasts for his lost friend. Biff swam out to the yawl. A quick inspection showed the easy action to be a stout ship. She had taken on little water. Her seams had held. Her mast had stood the strain. Biff took out the emergency suit of sail and rigged them to the halyards. He started the engine, let it idle as he raised the anchor, then put out to sea. He ran on engine past the lava promontory, bringing the boat as close into shore as he felt safe. No sign of Lee. Biff put back out to sea, raised the jibsail, and cruised along the coast, his eyes constantly scanning the shoreline. He didn't know how far down the big island he sailed, but he dreaded turning about and giving up. Finally, he felt he had to. He had to get back to where he had left his father and Mr. Mayonelli and tell them the tragic news. Biff came about. Now he sailed in the opposite direction. He rounded the lava promontory, lashed the tiller, and went forward to raise the mainsail. Returning to the cockpit, Biff cast a final look at the spot on the black beach where he had spent the night. His heart leaped. There was someone on the beach, jumping up and down, waving madly. Lee! With a shout of happiness, Biff turned the yawl inshore. Lee had already dashed into the water and was swimming towards the approaching boat. Biff came about quickly, headed the yawl into the wind. Lee reached its side and Biff pulled him aboard. He threw his arms round Lee's wet body and hugged him in sheer happiness. Then he stepped back and sized Lee up carefully. Except for some scratches and a deep gash on one leg, Lee looked fine. I thought you were a goner, Biff said. Nope, old Davy Jones hasn't got me in his locker yet. What happened? Where have you been? Lee grinned. I fell overboard. I had just let go the anchor when my foot caught and I went over. A current caught me and carried me away from the boat. The anchor must have dragged for quite a distance before it caught, because when I finally made sure, the yawl wasn't in sight. Where'd you land? The other side of the lava cliff? Yep, and there was no way to get over it. I know that. I walked down the beach to the cliff, but it can't be climbed from this side either. Both boys were silent for a minute, thinking about their narrow escape. So what did you do, Lee? I started up the cliff, the side of it. I had to find some way of getting over it, hoping to find you safe on the other side. Yes, go on. Well, it was growing dark. I slipped several times, cut myself too. I see you did. We'd better put some antiseptic on that cut. I've already cleaned it out with salt water, stung like the dickens. We'll still do some doctoring. Now get on with your story, Biff ordered. Well, I knew I wouldn't make it at night, so I found a protected spot and went to sleep. This morning I made my way farther up the cliff, found a place where I could cross, and came over to this side. And I was gone. Yes, Biff, when I finally made it here, I could have died. No Biff, no boat. I was looking for you. I must have sailed two or three miles down the coast, trying to spot you. That's what I finally figured out, Biff. I thought that since the boat had gone and there was no wreckage on the beach, old E.A. hadn't smashed up. So putting my two heads together, 
I also figured you must be safe and had gone hunting for me, so I just sat and waited. Boy, when you rounded that promontory, was I ever glad. Me too, when I saw you jumping around like a crazy Indian. The boys smiled at each other. Their smiles turned to laughter, and for a few moments they let themselves go in a wild laughing bout. I should have known, Biff said, simmering down at last. I should have known that Likeki Mayanelli, champion swimmer of the islands, could take care of himself. It was close, though, Biff. I'll say it was. Biff put the easy action on a course for the spot where the dinghy had been beached. They sailed through the morning and well into the afternoon before they spotted their landmarks. Biff anchored the yawl. Both had felt sure their parents would be waiting for them on the beach. There was no sign of either man. What do we do now, Biff? Biff shrugged his shoulders helplessly. I don't know, Lee. All we can do is wait. It'll be dark soon. We can't search for them at night. Biff, you don't think that may be Perez Soto? Lee couldn't finish his sentence. Biff knew the worried thoughts which must be running through his friend's mind. The same thoughts were racing through his own. Had his father and Mr. Mayonelli been trapped by the enemy? End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Sixteen Held Prisoner. High up on the side of Meana Lower Volcano, Tom Brewster and Hank Mahanelli turned their binoculars on the sea ten thousand feet below them and several miles away. The men scanned the coastline inch by inch, searching for any activity on the wide horizon. "'Can't spot the easy action, Hank, can you?' Tom Brewster asked. "'No, but look over there, to your right. Line up on that tall palm tree, a couple of hundred feet down.' Tom Brewster followed his friend's directions. He adjusted his glasses. As the focus became sharp, he spotted a black object, apparently a boat, anchored offshore. "'Couldn't that be a black power boat? Looks like it to me, Tom,' Hank said. Brewster studied the boat for a minute before replying, "'I think it is. I'm sure it is. That must be Perez Soto's boat.' Mayanelli had turned his glasses in a direction where the easy action should be riding at anchor. "'I'm getting worried about the boys, Tom.' "'Oh, they'll be all right. They'll be coming into sight any moment now. Anything in particular worrying you?' We spotted Perez Soto's boat. They haven't had any trouble with him. It was late afternoon. Hank Mahanelli had turned his glasses to the south, looking out over K. Lay. See that cloud formation to the south, he said. It's building up fast. It could be a Kona wind coming up. Maybe we'd better start down then, Mr. Brewster suggested. The two men had descended only halfway down the side of the volcano when the Kona storm struck. They had to halt. It was too dangerous to make the steep descent in the raging storm, the same storm that had hit the easy action two hours earlier. The high wind, ripping and roaring, whining against the side of the mountain, was followed by a sheet of rain. Tom Brewster and Hank Mayanelli had to scramble for any cover they could find. They located a small but deep depression, more of a pocket than a cave, and dived into it. Water trickled in, wetting them, but it was better than being in the open with the rain and wind lashing at them. Shortly after nightfall, the storm lessened. There was no question of trying to continue their descent. Have to make the best of it for the night, Mr. Brewster said. What about the boys? Hank asked. Nothing we can do, Hank. Don't think I'm not worried. I am. But I do trust Biff. He's been up against many a tough situation and has always come through. He will this time too, and so will Lee. Tom hoped his strong tone of confidence would be imparted to his friend. He knew that the Mahanellis weren't accustomed to running into the dangerous situations that had been part of his own life for many years, and recently had become almost a pattern for Biff too. Henry Mahanelli was made of stout stuff too. He also knew that, when faced with a situation where there was no immediate out, the best thing to do was to face up to it and hope for the best. 
Tom Brewster changed the subject. I've an idea, Hank. I base it on seeing that black powerboat anchored offshore. What is it, Tom? I think that Perez Soto and whoever is working with him must be ashore. I think they must have Dr. Weber with them. It would be too easy to spot someone being held captive in a confined a space as a boat. I'm with you in that thinking, Tom. Tell me this, then. Don't you think they must have a hideout somewhere nearby? They wouldn't want to be too far from their anchorage. They'd want to be able to get to their boat quickly if any definite news came about the location of Huntington's sunken sloop. There are all sorts of places round here, Tom. Lean-tos, shacks. Finding one certain hideout won't be simple. There's also a lot of the Moana Lure, too. Don't expect too much too soon. I know, but I won't rest until I've made every effort to find Dr. Weber. Well, Tom, if we don't rest now, we won't have the strength to continue our search. Let's try to get some sleep. Good idea. They spent a restless night in their cramped, wet quarters. Daylight, with the bright sun already sending up steam vapours as it dried the wet mountainside, was a welcome relief. The first thing that both men did was to scan the shoreline again with their binoculars, searching for the easy action. Failure to spot her increased the worry in both men's minds. Neither spoke of the matter. Each knew how greatly concerned the other was. But there was no point in dumping one worry upon another. Come on, Hank, let's get back on down. The boys may be there when we arrive. They started on down the side of Moana Loa, at an elevation of about 1,000 feet, almost directly opposite the anchored black power boat. They halted for a breather. They were only a mile or so from the shore. Their intention was to cut to their left, now that the going was easier, at the lower altitude. The descent was no longer so precipitate. They headed almost due south now. They stayed at the same elevation, stopping now and again to sweep the coastline with their glasses. At one halt, Tom Brewster placed a retaining hand on Mayanelli just as he started off. Hold it a minute, Hank, Tom said in a low voice. Hear anything? Hank Mayanelli listened. In a few moments, he nodded his head. Sound like voices to you? Yes, and angry ones. Come along then, let's find out. The voices seemed to be coming from a point below them, not too far below, and just a bit to their right. They proceeded most cautiously in the direction of the voices, careful not to start any pebbles or small stones rolling downward. Easing themselves down, the two men came to a ledge. It projected out like the roof of a shed or porch. Tom Brewster got down on his stomach. He wormed his way forward. The voices were coming, it appeared, from directly beneath him. Inching ahead, Tom Brewster came to the edge of the ledge. Carefully, he craned his head forward and looked down. He saw the tops of two men's heads. A third man was stretched out on a makeshift bed of brush, covered with a warm cloth. The third man was Dr. Weber. The doctor's cheeks were sunken. His colour was bad. He looked completely ill and worn out. Towering over the doctor was Perez Soto. Thomas Brewster couldn't see the other man's face, but he knew it must have anger written on it from the tone of his voice. Dr. Weber groaned as he turned on his side. Brewster could see that his hands were bound behind his back. His ankles were also lashed together. You old fool, Perez Soto said. Why should it make any difference to you whether I get the cesium or Brewster gets it? You're a scientist. Bah! A scientist should put his science before all else. Brewster heard the doctor's reply in a voice barely audible. There are certain things even a scientist places a greater value on. Friendship, loyalty, humanity. Perez Soto leaned over the old man, his arm raised as if to strike him. Brewster had all he could do to keep himself from leaping off the edge onto Perez Soto's back. But Soto's henchman stood, gun in hand, by the old man's side. I give you this day and no more, my fine doctor, Perez Soto said. 
By nightfall, if you do not reveal to me the location of the cesium strike, the world will lose one of its most eminent scientists. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Seventeen A Dangerous Dive. Biff and Lee were up with the first rays of daylight. After a hurried breakfast, they prepared to go ashore. Do you think it's safe to leave the boat unguarded? Biff Lee wanted to know. No, I don't. I know darn well that Perez Soto would like nothing better than to find the easy action with no one around and scuttle her. What do we do then? We take the chance, Biff said grimly. We've got to. Finding our fathers is more important than all the yawls and all the cesium in the world. Lee smiled in agreement. We're going to be awfully wet when we get ashore. The dinghy was still secreted behind the beach brush. The yawl had no other. Couldn't you kind of kick your way ashore, swimming on your back, Lee? Biff asked. Sure, Biff. Why? Well, here's what you try to do. Jump overboard, turn on your back. I'll hand you some dry shorts and sweatshirts. Hold them out of the water over your head and see if you can make sure that way. I'll try, Biff but I don't know. Getting through the surf isn't going to be easy. Probably get the clothes wet anyway. We'll try it, and if they do get wet, the sun will dry them fast. Lee dived into the ocean. He plunged around like a porpoise for a few moments, enjoying and getting the feel of the water. Then he turned on his back and kicked to the side of the yawl. Biff handed down a bundle of clothing, and Lee propelled himself away from the boat with a powerful thrust against its side. Biff slung a pair of binoculars in a waterproof case around his neck and slipped into the water. Lee's progress was slow. His leg thrusts were those of an excellent backstroke swimmer, but unable to use his arms, he couldn't go very fast. Biff stayed alongside him. "'I'm going ahead when we reach the shore breakers,' Biff called to Lee. I'm taller than you. Maybe I can reach bottom and take the clothes from you before a wave rolls over you. It was a good plan, but the sea has a way of upsetting good plans, and it did this time. Boys and clothes reached shore equally wet. They wrung out their shorts and sweatshirts as best they could, donned them, and headed up the southern slope of the Moana Loa in the area called Kai. They toiled upward, resting at regular intervals. It was hot, tiring work. Their wet clothes clung to their bodies. Perspiration from the effort kept their clothes damp. Even in the heat, Biff found himself shivering convulsively. I've got a clammy feeling from these clothes. Guess that's why I'm shivering, Biff said to his friend. He hoped it was the damp clothing rather than fear for the safety of his father and Hanale Mayanelli. By noon, the boys had climbed nearly 3,000 feet. Let's take a break, Biff called. By me, fine. That was a tough climb, Lee answered. Biff stretched out. Lee remained seated. Let me have the glasses, Biff. Biff handed them over, shielded his eyes from the sun, and tried to catch a catnap. He was just dozing off when he felt Lee nudge him. Biff, Biff! The excitement in Lee's voice brought Biff to a sitting position in a hurry. What is it, Lee? Over there, see, about halfway between Kale and the point to the north, Kuana Point. Yes, but how can I see anything without the glasses? Lee unslung them from around his neck and handed them to Biff. Now look, follow the direction of my arm. About half a mile, I'd guess, offshore, almost exactly between Kale and Kuana Point. I'm following you, Lee. Move your glasses around in the tight area of a few hundred yards. See if you spot a dark object on the bottom of the ocean. The boys were looking almost straight down. From his many flights over water, Biff knew that from above, one could see through the water to depths of forty to fifty feet with ease. The water acted as a magnifying glass. He moved the glasses in a tight circle. Then he spotted what had caused all Lee's excitement. Lying on the bottom of the ocean was a dark object. 
It was slender, about forty feet long, Biff judged. Do you think it could be, Biff? Think it could be a boat? Biff didn't want to raise either his own or Lee's hopes too high. Couldn't it be a coral formation, Lee? he asked. Gee, I don't think so, Biff. There'd be more than one formation of coral around. It's mighty rare to find just a sliver stuck out somewhere in the ocean. Then it could be a boat. A boat on the bottom of the ocean. Huntington's boat? Could be, Lee, but let's not get our hopes up too high. Let's go. Let's get back to the easy action and cruise over there. We've got to find out. Before agreeing, Biff thought about his father and Hank Mayonelli. Should the boys continue the search? After all, the same storm that had forced him and Lee to spend the night ashore could well have caused the fathers to take shelter. Perhaps their parents even now were back at the beach opposite the anchorage, or even aboard the yawl. Biff made his decision. OK, Lee, let's go, Biff said. The boys reached the beach opposite the Easy Action's anchorage in half the time it had taken them to make the ascent. Downhill all the way. We'll take the dinghy out, Biff said. Won't do our parents any good if the yawl isn't here. Their haste matched the excitement growing inside them about their find. Of course, both knew they could be in for a great disappointment. Biff pushed that depressing thought out of his mind. Lee up the anchor while Biff got the engine started, then went to the cockpit. Biff took the tiller and pointed the yawl's bow directly out to sea. With a careful eye, he measured the distance from shore until he was sure he was about half a mile out. Then he put the helm of the easy action hard over to the starboard side and cruise parallel to the shore. Think you've got that spot well marked in your mind, Lee? Sure have, Biff. Remember when we spotted it? There was a large oval patch of whitish lava just to the left of where we were resting. I'm sure we can spot it from the sea. OK, you be the lookout. I'm going to keep this boat on as true a course as I can. I think we're just about as far offshore now as we figured that sunken boat was. What do you think? Looks right to me. What do you want me to do? You take the glasses, keep them turned on the manure lower slope. Soon as you pick up that oval lava patch, sing out. Aye, aye, Captain. Lee went forward with the binoculars. He kept them trained shoreward, aiming them about 2,000 feet up the slope. The distance to the spot the boys had in mind was greater than they had thought it to be. They covered a lot of water. Biff checked his watch. He hoped they could spot the sunken hulk before the light went. Land ho! Lee sang out and came racing back over the deck to the cockpit. Oval patch coming into sight, Captain. Here, take the glasses and see for yourself. Biff turned the tiller over to Lee and took a look. There was the patch, all right. It was off their starboard bow, still a good two miles ahead. Biff revved up the engine, and the Easy Action's auxiliary pushed the yawl along at a good eight knots. In twenty minutes, Biff timed the run, figuring the miles the yawl would cover at full speed. They were dead opposite the lava patch. Biff cut the motor. It ought to be somewhere about here, Biff said. You shin up the mainmast. I'm going to put the yawl in a tight circle, starting right here, and I'll increase the circle every time we make one full turn. While Lee was climbing the mainmast to a height of about 15 feet, Biff ducked down into the cabin for a marking buoy. This he tossed overside. Its metal weight plunged to the bottom and held. The red and white buoy would be the hub of the circle he would put the yawl into. Biff started the engine again. All set, Lee? Start the merry-go-round, Lee called back. The easy action made a tight circle. Biff edged the tiller away from him, and the second circle was a greater circumference. Biff eased off on the tiller again. The yawl described the larger circle. If the sunken hulk was in that area, there shouldn't be any chance of missing it. The water was clear, the sea calm. Round and round they went. The bobbing red and white marking boy became a mere speck. Biff could barely make it out with his naked eye. Half an hour passed, then another. The sun was slanting downward, not more than two hours from its nightly dip into the Pacific. Hold it, Biff, hold it, came the excited shout from Lee. Biff threw the engine into reverse. 
He leapt forward and let down the anchor. He turned and looked up at Lee, who, shading his eyes, was peering intently into the water off the yawl's port side. I spotted it, Biff, I'm sure of it. If I haven't, well, you come up and have a look. Lee slid down the mainmast and Biff shinned up. He looked at the spot Lee had pointed out. For a time, his eyes were unable to discover any difference as he squinted, looking down into the water. After several minutes, he did make out a formation differing from anything around it. It was a dark object. Biff could think only of a whale or some other large sea animal lying on the ocean's floor. You're right, Lee. There's something down there. He slid down the mast. But how are we going to find out just what it is? Lee grinned. That's easy, Biff. You have on board your ship easy action, Captain Brewster, none other than the world's record-holding free skin diver, Likaki Mayanelli. You're going to dive down there, Biff said, awe in his voice. Sure, why not? Well, you're not going to until we sound for the depth here. What's the deepest dive you've ever made, Lee? Forty-five, maybe fifty feet if I stretch it a little, Lee replied. Biff got out the sounding line. This was a thin, strong rope. It had a heavy sinker on the end. At intervals of one foot, it had a metal weight to mark off the depth. Biff tossed it overboard. The line seemed to run out endlessly. Biff was afraid the ocean's depth here was going to turn out to be too great for Lee to try a dive. Then he felt the thud of the heavy sinker touching bottom. He drew the rope tight. Here we go, Lee. Let's both count the markers as we pull it up. Biff worked slowly, carefully. They couldn't risk any mistake on their count. When the sinker broke the surface, Biff looked at Lee. How many markers did you count? Forty-three. Does that check with your count? On the nose, Lee. On the nose. I make it forty-three, too. Good. I can make that easy. But hey, how am I going to know if it's the right boat? What was the name of Mr. Huntington's sloop? The Sea Islander, Lee. OK, can you work the boat over a bit? I'd like to be right over her when I make my dive. All right, Lee, take up the anchor, just enough to get it off the bottom. Then let it go the second I call. Biff went back to the cockpit. He pushed the engine's starting button. He had to go forward about ten feet and edge the yawl to the port about fifteen. He shoved the tiller away, putting the boat to the port, and went forward about twenty feet. Then he pulled the tiller to him, put the yawl in reverse, and came back. Let her go, he called out. He felt the anchor grab. It must be almost alongside the sunken object. Lee came back to the cockpit, darted into the cabin, and came out with a small anchor. It was a spare for the dinghy. What do you want that thing for? Biff demanded. Oh, wait, I'm going down with it. It will pull me down a lot faster than I could swim, and forty-three feet is a lot of water. I'll say it is. You all ready? Lee nodded his head. He had changed into brief, skin-tight swim trunks. He walked over to the starboard side of the yawl. He took some wooden matches and hurled them into the water. What's that for? Biff asked. I want to find out if there's much flow here. If there's any current, I have to judge my dive by the current. They watched the matches. They seemed to bob up and down in the same place. Lee had tossed them about ten feet from the yawl. As they watched, they saw the distance between the yawl and the matches closing. It was closing all right, but slowly. No all I have to, Biff. Very slight current. Nothing to worry about. Nothing I have to figure on particularly. Here I go. Before Biff could even call good luck, Lee, the small anchor held in front of him, plunged into the water. The wait for Lee to surface began. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 18 Exploring the Depths When Likake disappeared beneath the surface, Biff glanced quickly at his watch. He tried to remember the record for a person's holding his breath while underwater. 
Was it three minutes? Four. He remembered reading of some Polynesian divers in Bali who had remained submerged for six minutes. How long could Lee hold his breath? Biff looked at his watch again. Already the sweep hand had passed the two-minute mark. Biff began to worry. The seconds ticked by slowly, as if held back by a magnet. The three-minute mark was approaching. Surely Lee couldn't hold out much longer. Biff's eyes kept shifting from the water to the sweep hand of his watch. Three minutes, still no sign of Lee. Biff made up his mind. He is going in after Lee. He slipped off his watch and peeled off his shirt. Just as he was preparing to dive, Lee's head broke the surface. For several moments, the Hawaiian boy lay in the water, head back, body floating. He needed time to recover. Biff could see his chest heaving up and down beneath the two inches of water covering it. Finally, Lee turned his head. He looked up at Biff and smiled. He turned over and with one powerful stroke propelled himself to the side of the yawl. Biff's eager hands helped heave Lee overside. You all right? You were sure down long enough, Biff said. Lee nodded his head. His chest still moved in and out as he took deep breaths, exhaling them slowly. Biff was dying to find out what, if anything, Lee had learned on his dive, but he didn't want to press his friend. Lee let out a, Ah, boy, guess that's the deepest I've ever dived. Biff couldn't stand the suspense any longer. And what did you find? Was it a sloop? Was it the Sea Islander? Yes to both questions, Biff. Whoopee! Yow! We found it! We found it! Biff grabbed Lee by the shoulders and swirled him around. You sure, Lee? You're positive it's a Sea Islander? I'm sure, Biff. There was a life preserver still attached to the side of the sloop's cabin. I could make out the letters spelling the boat's name, and those letters sure did spell out Sea Islander. What condition is she in? Well, I couldn't tell much. She's heeled over on her starboard side, I think. Not all the way. Her mast is broken off, as far as I could tell. Some of her ropes are still attached. I brushed against them both going down and coming back up. Lee had stretched out on the deck of the easy action. Strength was flowing back into his body. Staying submerged as long as he had takes a lot out of a person physically. Well, Lee, I think we'd better get back to our original anchorage. Your dad and mine must be back there by now. If they're not, well, we'll have to forget about the Sea Islander and really look for them. We may have to go for help. Before we go, though, Biff, I'd like to go back down to the Sea Islander. Again? What in the world for? Not all the way, but don't you think it would be a good idea if we could attach a marker to one of those loose lines? Then we'd be able to spot this location easily. Good idea, Lee. How near the surface do those lines come? Oh, I guess twenty, maybe twenty-five feet. Won't be much of a dive this time, not after going down over forty feet. OK, Lee, you lie there and rest. I'll rig a marking boy. Biff went below and took out another boy from the yawl's captain's chest. This was an all-white one. He attached a short length of nylon rope to the boy and a metal clip to the other end of the rope. Returning to the deck, he showed it to Lee. How will this do? I figure you can tie a fast knot in one of those loose lines, then just snap this metal fastener below the knot. Then it won't slip off. Swell, Biff, I've got my breath back now. This won't take a minute. Lee took the boy. A frown came over his face. What's the trouble? Biff asked. Well, with this boy, it's going to make it tougher to get down. The other time, remember, I had the help of a weight pulling me down. The dinghy's emergency anchor. Now I've got this boy, which will be working against me. I don't know. I'll fix that. Biff went astern. He pulled in the dinghy, which was tied to the stern of the yawl, hopped in and cut its anchor. Here you are, Lee. That cleans us out of dinghy anchors. They go fast on a day like this. Mark down special sail. Lee grinned in reply. 
He stepped to the side of the yawl, holding boy and anchor in front of him. Once more, the Hawaiian boy jumped feet first into the blue water. Biff looked at his watch again, but he wasn't worried this time. Lee was only going down twenty feet. Feeling quite happy over finding the Sea Islander, Biff whistled a popular tune. He looked up at Marn at lower, wondering where his father might be at the moment. He glanced down at his watch. He couldn't believe his eyes. Unless he had misread the time of Lee's submersion, three minutes had already passed. Biff swiftly went into action. Lee shouldn't have taken more than two minutes, not that long, for his dive. Biff's body split the water. He pulled himself downward. The water pressure at the depth of fifteen feet was already exerting abnormal pressure on his chest. Still, he pulled himself downward. He had to. I've got to find Lee, he told himself. At twenty feet beneath the surface, with his lungs screaming for air, Biff's hands touched Lee's head. The Hawaiian boy was fighting frantically to free one leg from a rope entwined around it. Biff used Lee's body to pull himself the four feet further downward to reach the rope. He tore at it, felt it give, and Lee's leg was free. Biff placed his hands on Lee's body and gave it a powerful thrust upward. Then, barely able to hold his breath any longer, he spread his hands, palms downward, pushed with all his might, and shot towards the surface. When Biff broke the surface, gasping for breath, he looked for his friend. There was Lee, only a few feet away. But from the position of his head lolling to one side in the water, Biff knew the boy was unconscious. Tired as he was, his own lungs aching from the recent strain put upon them, Biff swam to Lee's side. At first, all he did was support Lee's head, keeping his nose and mouth from going under water. After a few moments, Biff kicked his way to the side of the yawl. He felt the need of support too. With one hand holding on to the easy action amidship, he held on to Lee with the other. Biff had no way of knowing, as yet, whether Lee had swallowed so much water that his lungs were filled. He kept the word drowned out of his mind. When he had regained his strength, Biff let go of the yawl. Treading water, he took Lee's head in both hands and drew it right up to his own face. He placed his cheek against Lee's nose. Thank heavens he could feel Lee's breath on his face. Biff pulled himself and Lee back to the side of the easy action. He placed Lee directly against the side of the yawl. He released him and at the same instant pulled himself quickly onto the deck. Then belly down, he leaned over and was just able to grasp Lee under the arms. With a powerful tug, he pulled the still unconscious boy onto the deck. His first action was to turn him over and administer first aid. He raised and lowered Lee's body to expel any water that might still be in his lungs. Then he placed Lee on his side, his face turned toward the deck. He watched Lee's troubled breathing become easier. Biff sat back with a sigh of relief. His friend was going to be all right. A tremendous weariness swept over Biff. He hadn't known how near to the point of exhaustion he had brought himself. For the next half hour, both boys lay on the deck, regaining their strength. The slanting rays of the setting sun were casting long shadows on the slope of Moana Loa. Biff sat up. He didn't know at first what had caught his attention. He stared at the side of the volcano. He saw it again. A quick flash, a bright reflection. It disappeared. Biff kept his eyes trained on the spot. There it was again. He turned. The sun was low on the horizon, but still bright. He realized that the easy action was directly between the setting sun and the flash of reflected light he had spotted. What could it be? Was it his imagination? Biff felt Lee stir beside him. The Hawaiian boy opened his eyes. A feeble smile touched his lips. He tried to speak. Take it easy, Lee. Rest a little longer. Lee closed his eyes. Biff looked again at the spot on the Moana Loa where he had seen the flash. It came again, then disappeared. Biff heard Lee's faltering voice behind him. You saved my life, Biff. Lee was sitting up now. Biff felt embarrassed. What was there to say? He turned to his friend, and the smiles they exchanged expressed more than any words could possibly do. What happened anyway, Lee? It was my own fault, Biff. I guess I panicked. I got down easily. Found a loose rope, but I had trouble staying submerged while I tried to tie a knot. So I made a quick slip knot and hooked it over my leg to hold me steady while I tied the knot to fasten the clasp to. 
Biff frowned. You mean you sort of anchored yourself to the Sea Islander? Guess you could call it that. Anyway, it took longer than I figured. Once I had hooked the boy on the rope, I tried to free my leg from the slip knot. My body pulling on the knot had tightened it. The wet rope made the knot even harder to undo. That's when I panicked, I guess. The more I worked on the knot, the tighter it seemed to get. Then I sort of blacked out. I don't even remember your coming down to rescue me. Thank goodness I got there in time. Lee put his hands over his face. His shoulders shook. Biff realized the boy was crying. He said nothing. Better to let Lee get the shock out of his system. He continued to watch his friend carefully. Lee had come close to death. Lee, after a few moments, removed his hands and grinned. Sorry, Biff, I guess I'm acting like a baby. Nonsense. After what you just went through, well, say, I want you to see if you can see what I just saw. If you can follow all that, see and saw. Biff wanted to change the subject, stop Lee from thinking about his narrow escape. He also wanted to check the flash he had just seen. Look over there, Lee, about two thousand feet up the slope of Mauna Loa. He pointed with his arm. I'd swear I've just been seeing light reflected. Seems like a mirror pointed into the sun. You know, the way kids sometimes signal to one another. Lee raised his eyes. Both boys saw the reflection come at the same time. I see it, Biff. There it is. Now it's gone. What do you think it could be, Lee? Like you said, maybe a mirror or... or glasses. That's it, glasses. Someone's got binoculars trained on us and we are right in the path of the setting sun. Someone's watching us through the binoculars. I'll bet you're right. It's probably my dad and yours. Hey, I sure hope so. But even as Biff spoke the words, another idea came into his head. Or, Lee, it could be Perez Soto. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Nineteen Reunion. It was Perez Soto. The swarthy adventurer was standing on a lava ledge not far from the spot where Biff and Lee had sighted the sunken hulk of the Sea Islander earlier in the day. Through his powerful binoculars he had watched every movement the boys had made. He had seen Lee's first and second dives. His glasses were of such powerful magnification he could even see the exultant expressions on the boys' faces. He knew they had made an important discovery, and he was certain what the discovery was. A crafty smile came over his heavy features as a plan formed in his scheming mind. He would go back to his hideout and get his henchman, Madeira, then quickly to his powerboat, the Black Falcon, and head for the dot on the ocean where he had seen the boys. He had little thought for Dr. Weber. The thing to do now, and do it fast, was to get to the sunken sea islander and stake his salvage claim. In the case of a lost boat or a sunken one, it was first come, first served. The important thing, though, was not only to take the claim, but remain in possession of it. With his glasses still on the easy action, he saw one of the boys raising the anchor. He saw the yawls set a course towards K. Lee, leaving the sunken sloop abandoned. Too bad about Dr. Weber. Maybe someone would find him. Maybe they wouldn't. Perez Soto didn't care. All he wanted to do now was to establish his salvage rights, and to do so in the shortest possible time. He stepped back from the ledge and started walking rapidly towards his hideout. Thomas Brewster and Hanali Mayanelli watched with torn emotions as Perez Soto threatened and tormented Dr. Weber. Both men wanted to act. Both knew, however, that to do so would not only endanger the doctor's life, but would also jeopardize their chances of rescuing the old man. The morning passed. Perez Soto continued his threats, but the old doctor held firm. He refused to answer any of his captor's questions. Madeira, 
Pierre Soto's henchman kept his snub-nosed revolver steadily pointing at the doctor. Brewster and Mayonelli didn't dare try to jump the kidnappers. About noontime, Perez Soto took the gun from Madeira. Madeira prepared some food by lighting a small fire and heating up some stew he took from a can. The smell of the steaming stew, rising to the cliff where Brewster and Mayonelli were hiding, sent sharp pangs of hunger rumbling through their stomachs. Shortly after Perez Soto and Madeira had eaten, Perez Soto, as if having an afterthought, poked a spoonful of food at the doctor's mouth. The doctor turned his head away. Look at that, Hank, Brewster whispered. I think the doctor wants to die. He's refusing food. Perhaps he feels that death is preferable to any more of Perez Soto's threats and demands. About two o'clock, Perez Soto entered the cave, which he was using for a hideout, and emerged minutes later with a pair of binoculars slung over his shoulder. Guard the old man well, he ordered. I'll be back before sunset, he strode off. Brewster whispered to Mayonelli. I think our chance will come now. We'll let Perez Soto get well on his way. Then we'll find a way of jumping the guard. The time came more quickly than either man could have hoped for. Madeira, his stomach filled with stew, could be seen to yawn. They saw him shake his head to ward off sleep. Apparently feeling that there was little threat of Dr. Weber's attempting to escape, the guard checked the ropes binding the doctor's hands and feet. He sat down nearby, propping his back against a large boulder, the gun in his hands. Brewster and Mayor Nelly watched every move. They saw the guard's head nod forward. They saw him bring it up with a jerk and shake his head from side to side in an effort to remain awake. They saw the process repeated. For the third time, the guard's head dropped forward. This time it stayed there. Now's our chance, Brewster said to his friend. Mayonelli nodded in the affirmative. Brewster measured the distance between himself and the sleeping guard. The drop from the ledge to the ground in front of the cave was a good fifteen feet. From where he would land, Brewster would have to cross a clearing of ten feet before he could reach the guard. The noise of his landing would certainly arouse the guard. Before Brewster could cross the opening to close with him, the guard would have time to raise his pistol and fire. A plan shaped up in Thomas Brewster's mind. Hank, here's how we'll have to do it. You crawl back, make your way to the rear of the guard, if it's possible. Creep up as near to him as you can. Keep me in sight. When you see me leap from this ledge, you spring forward, try to take him from the rear. Hurl a rock at him, anything. Just try to give me enough time to leap across the clearing and grapple with the guard before he can fire. Once I get my hands on him, I can handle him. But if you can't see me, Tom, how will you know when to leap? It's now 2.22. I'll make my move at exactly 2.30. I'll just have to trust that you've been able to get behind the guard. Go along now and good luck. Brewster kept shifting his glance from the sleeping guard to the minute hand on his watch. It seemed that the large hand would never reach the half-hour mark, but it did. At exactly 2.30, Brewster stood up. He jumped. He went to his knees and rolled when he hit the ground, 15 feet beneath him. It was a fall he had learned in his army training, one designed to prevent a broken ankle. He leapt quickly to his feet. The guard, awakened, stood up. He was still groggy from the sleep and confused. He could hear sounds from behind him and hear right in front of him. A large man was charging him. Brewster hit Madeira with a jolting right cross before the guard could think straight. He hit the ground with a thud. Brewster was on top of him like a hungry tiger making a kill. From the rear, Mayonelli sprang into the arena, spotted the pistol still in the guard's outstretched hand and kicked it away. The fight was over. It had been an easy victory. In minutes, Dr. Weber was freed and his bonds were used to truss up the guard. As an extra precaution, Brewster used his handkerchief to gag the guard. He didn't want him calling for help. No telling how near Perez Soto might be. Dr. Weber, my friend, Brewster leaned over to help the doctor to his feet. How are you? Are you injured in any way? Mostly my dignity, the doctor grunted gruffly. You are able to walk? We must get away from here before Perez Soto returns. Harump, the good doctor harumped indignantly. You youngsters seem to think I'm an old dotard, dying on my feet. Mr. Brewster had to smile at being called a youngster. 
but he was a good thirty years younger than Dr. Weber. Of course I could walk. The doctor took two steps and would have fallen if Biff's father hadn't caught him. Dr. Weber glared up at his friend. Release me. All I need is for the circulation to be restored to my legs. I've been tied up most of the time. The doctor was stubborn. He gingerly raised one leg, then the other. He flapped his arms against his side. He cautiously took another step, glancing out of the side of his eye to see if Tom Brewster was prepared to help him. The doctor's vitality was amazing. Brewster got him some water. He forced him to take several mouthfuls of the stew, now cold, but energy giving none the less. All right now, the doctor said. You lead the way. I'll follow. Brewster started off on a path leading down to the coast. Before doing so, he signalled to Mr. Mayonelli to stay close behind the doctor, ready to catch him if he should fall. Their progress downward was slow. Brewster halted every hundred yards, sometimes more often, where the descent was difficult, to allow the doctor to regain his strength. Brewster knew Dr. Weber must be going along on sheer nervous energy. His frail body just wasn't young enough to take such punishment. But Biff's father knew also that it is amazing to just what great limits the human body can go when forced to do so. It was dusk when the three men stumbled onto the beach opposite the Easy Action's first anchorage. Thomas Brewster looked out over the ocean, and his heart leaped with joy. He saw the yawl coming into its anchorage, Lee in the bow, ready to drop the anchor, and Biff at the tiller. Hi, Biff! Hi, Lee! he called. End of chapter 19「Twenty of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Twenty Dawn Attack. Shouts of joy rippled across the water from Biff and Lee to their fathers. The boys hopped into the dinghy and sent it fairly flying over the waves to shore. The first thing to do was to get Dr. Weber on the boat. The old man's stout, fierce spirit seemed to leave him once he reached the anchorage. He had exhausted his reserve strength. He was near the end of his remarkable endurance. The others were ferried to the easy action. Dr. Weber was bedded down. Hot soup was prepared for the aged scientist, and shortly he was sleeping like a baby. A quite wrinkled baby, true but his sleep was as sound and peaceful as that of a one-year-old. Biff quickly filled his father in on what had happened. He saved until the last the discovery of the Sea Islander. But I think maybe Perez Soto has spotted her too, Biff had to add in conclusion. I think he must have spotted us when Lee was diving. Thomas Brewster turned to Mr. Mayonelli. That must have been why Perez Soto went away, giving us the chance to rescue Dr. Weber. I'm sure it was, the Hawaiian answered. Now what we've got to do is to get back to the Sea Islander before Perez Soto does. We've got to hook on to the sunken boat somehow, then we've got to get into her cabin and locate that metal box with the cesium sample and the map showing where the field is located. Brewster paused. He had to think this thing through clearly now. There could be no mistake, no more risks. They would have to get a professional diver. Hank, where is the nearest town to here, a place where you can hire a professional diver, someone with an aqualung? I imagine Hilo would be the nearest place. How far is that from where we are? Oh, I'd say roughly seventy-five miles. Any way of getting there aside from walking? Sure, Tom. I would have to walk inland until I reached the Wamalahaya Highway. That's the road which circles the island. I know I could rent a car or taxi at Honupu Landing, not much more than an hour's drive from there into Hilo. Right, what do you say to this? We'll put you ashore right now. You get to Hilo. Hire a skin diver and get back here as early tomorrow morning as you can. We've got to get back to the Sea Islander right away. How far up the coast is she, Biff? 
An hour, maybe a little more. That's pushing the yawl at full speed. All right, Biff, you row Mr. Mayonelli ashore. Lee and I will make ready. Get back fast. Aye, aye, sir, Biff grinned at his father. It was good to have someone else make the decisions for a change. And when Biff's father went into action, he did so with a snap and precision that commanded respect. It didn't take Biff long to set Mr. Mayonelli ashore. The dinghy was quickly secured once the boy returned, and the easy action headed up coast at full throttle. Think we can find the place in the dark, Biff? his father asked. It would take a bit of doing, Dad, but we set a marking boy over the Sea Islander attached to one of her halyards. Good thing we did, too. We'd never be able to locate a boat on the bottom at night. It took more time than they calculated to locate the marking boy. They had to cruise the area for more than an hour before a shout from Lee told them that they had found it. Now the problem is, Mr. Brewster said, how are we going to hook our anchor into the sunken ship? Once we do that, there can be no doubt as to our salvage rights. How about this, Dad? Biff suggested. Let's drop the hook until we can feel her just touch the bottom. Then we can run back and forth over the Sea Islander until we feel the anchor's point sink into her side. Good, excellent suggestion. Biff's father acted at once. He brought the easy action about and aimed her bow directly at the marking boy. They felt the anchor drag as it struck the submerged sloop, but on their first pass the hook didn't catch. Mr. Brewster reversed his course. This time the hook sunk into the side of the Sea Islander and held. Mr. Brewster revved up the engine and the easy action tugged at her sunken sister. That ought to set the anchor in her side, but good, Mr. Brewster said. He cut the engine. Try the winch, Biff. See if you can raise the anchor. I want to make sure we're really caught onto her. Biff did so. He put all his strength in trying to turn the winch. The anchor was set. The easy action and the Sea Islander were joined by a stout, thick hawser. It was late. Everyone, feeling happy about their success, was ready to turn in. Tired, Lee? Biff asked. His answer was a quick nod of his friend's head as Lee headed below for the comfort of his berth. I'm going to sleep on deck again tonight, Dad. Perez Soto's boat is in these waters. I don't think he'll try anything tonight, but you never can tell. All right, Biff, I agree. We can't take any chances with success so near at hand. Biff rolled himself up in a sleeping bag and was asleep the minute he finished zipping it up. Early in the morning, an hour or more before sunrise, he was wide awake. He lay still, staring up at the sky. Stars covered it like a million white dots on a field of navy blue. A quarter moon, looking like an orange section, still hung in the sky. A soft splash attracted Biff's attention. He rose on one elbow and looked in the direction of the noise. It came again. Could be a fish jumping, he told himself. Adjusting his eyes to the night, Biff peered more keenly toward the sound. He raised his glance and his heart started thudding. Lying at anchor not more than a quarter of a mile away was the outline of a powerboat. Biff was sure it was the same one that had tried to swamp the easy action. Biff crept noiselessly to the stern of the yawl. He went below. Reaching his father's berth, he shook him gently. Dad, Dad, he whispered softly. Wake up. I think someone's trying to board the boat. Thomas Brewster was out of the berth in an instant. Lee, hearing the noise, leapt out of his bunk too. Silently, the three crept back to the cockpit. They raised their heads over the gunwale. Listen, Dad. Listen carefully. I heard a noise. Sounded like a fish jumping right over there. The three strained their ears. They heard the sound again. Then they saw what was causing it. A man was swimming toward the easy action. They could make out his head moving slowly but steadily along, coming toward the yawl. When the swimmer was some twenty feet from the easy action, the pale light of the moon was reflected by an object the swimmer was holding in his mouth. In the brief instant of the gleam, the object became clear to them all. It was a long knife. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 21 
A Human Fish What do you think he's up to, Biff? Lee asked in a whisper. The swimmer was nearing the yawl. With that knife in his mouth, I don't think there's much doubt about it. Do you, Dad? Depends on what you're thinking, son. Well, I think this is Perez Soto's last desperate effort to establish his salvage rights to the Sea Islander. I'm sure that's his boat over there, just off our starboard bow. See it? The power crews of the Black Falcon were sharply silhouetted now in the lightning dawn. Perez Soto sent that swimmer over to cut our anchor rope, Biff continued. Wouldn't you agree, Dad? You're right, Biff. Why would he want to do that? Lee asked. Well, if this man could cut our line and we were still asleep, we'd drift. Even in the slight current that runs in these waters, we'd drift half a mile or more in a very short time. Once we were out of the way, he could easily sink his own line onto the Sea Islander and establish his rights of salvage. The swimmer was now only ten feet from the yawl. Biff reached down and pulled out a boat hook, a long pole with a hook on one end, used to grab a mooring when coming into an anchorage. I'm going to hook me a human fish, he whispered. Biff raised the boat hook. He rested its hooked end on the gunwale. The swimmer was now within hooking distance. Biff shot the boat hook out. It grazed the swimmer's head, feeling it the swimmer dive. Biff had prodded forward with the boat hook. He felt it catch. The pole bent just like a fishing pole as the swimmer tried to get away. Got him, Dad, got him, Biff shouted happily. You sure have, Biff. You got him right by the seat of his swimming trunks. Here, let me give you a hand. Biff pulled the pole with his human catch on the other end, partly into the boat. He and his father put their weight onto the in-boat end. The pole became a lever, lifting their catch out of the water. A funnier catch Biff, his father and Lee had never seen. It was Lee who started laughing first. In the rapidly increasing daylight, they could see Perez Soto's man on the end of the pole. He was waving his arms, kicking his legs frantically. He looks like a crab, Lee shortled. He did. The man, caught by the seat of his swim pants on the hook, was unable to reach back to free himself. He was suspended three feet above the water, still kicking and squirming furiously. What shall I do with him, Dad? Throw him back? Thomas Brewster was laughing. I've used many a weapon to defend myself in the past, but a boat hook. This is the laughing end. Both boys made an ouch face at the bad pun. Mr. Brewster turned to Lee. Get a flashlight, Lee. I want to make sure who this human shark is. Lee darted into the cabin and darted right back. He didn't want to miss a thing. Thomas Brewster shone the flashlight on the hooked, would-be knife wielder's face. Just as I thought, Brewster said, it's the man who was guarding Dr. Weber. I heard Perez Soto call him Madeira. Madeira, in his frantic struggling, had dropped the knife from his mouth. He was no longer any threat to the easy action and her crew. Guess I might as well drop him back in the water, hadn't I, Dad? Biff asked. Sure, son, let him go. In the water he can free himself. Then you just watch him head back for Perez Soto and the Black Falcon. You're not serious, Dad, Biff exclaimed. Isn't it dangerous to let them get away? But Biff didn't have to drop Madeira back into the water. There came a ripping sound. Madeira's hooked swim trunk split. The water prowler hit the water with a belly whopper. Pantless, he turned and swam away. Biff, Lee and Mr. Brewster howled with laughter. When the laughter died away, Mr. Brewster said, To answer your question, Biff, they're too dangerous to keep aboard. We'll have to leave them to the authorities. They'll track them down now. It had grown much lighter. It was easy to follow the swimmer's progress back to the Black Falcon. He'll go without his breakfast when he gets back, Tom Brewster said. Perez Soto will be furious. Speaking of breakfast, Biff said. Me too, Lee cut in. They went below. All hungry, all happy, feeling that they were nearing the climax of their Hawaiian sea hunt. Looks like easy sailing from here on in, Dad, Biff said, munching a piece of toast. Well, don't get your hopes up too high, Biff. Why not, Dad? We still have to locate that metal box. We have no assurance that it's still in the Sea Islander's cabin. A frown of disappointment came over Biff's face. 
I'm not saying it isn't there, understand, his father went on. But remember, the Sea Islander has been on the bottom for several weeks. The box could have been tossed around in the storm that sank the boat. It might have floated out. I never thought of that. The remainder of their breakfast was eaten in a concerned silence. Biff and Lee were cleaning up the galley. Thomas Brewster was talking to Dr. Weber. The doctor had had a good night's sleep and said he was feeling fine. He chortled over the human fish incident. Biff's sharp ears caught the sound first. From a distance came a low, steady buzzing. Biff ran on deck. From just off K. Lee, he spotted a low-flying plane. It was coming directly at the easy action. In moments, Biff was able to distinguish its lines. Dad, Dad, he called. There's a seaplane coming this way. Lee was on deck first, followed by Thomas Brewster and Dr. Weber. They watched the plane. It came in low over the yawl, dipped its wings in salute, then described a long circle to head into the wind. It settled duck-like on the water and taxied towards the easy action. One man stood up in the open cockpit by the pilot. He was waving his arms. It's Dad, it's my father, Lee shouted excitedly. Well, it surely is, Lee. When your father goes into action, he moves fast. I never thought he'd come back in a plane. I thought he'd charter another boat, Mr. Brewster said. The seaplane taxied to within ten feet of the easy action, its twin propellers barely turning, just fast enough to give the plane headway. Henry Mahanelli stood up and tossed a rope towards the yawl. It fell short. He pulled it in, and again the rope snaked out towards the yawl. This time Biff caught it. He tugged on the rope, and the plane closed the gap of water separating it from the yawl. Its nose bumped gently against easy action's starboard side. Give us about five feet of play, young man, the pilot called out. Even in this calm sea, he didn't want to take any chances of the nose of his plane being punched in. I can do better than that, Biff called, knowing the reason for the pilot's concern. He went below and bought our extra boat snubbers, made of foam rubber. He hooked them over the gunwale, forming a soft, protecting barrier between the side of the yawl and the nose of the plane. Then he pulled the plane within two feet of the yawl, making it easy for the plane's passengers to hop from plane to boat. Hank Mahanelli was first aboard. He was followed by a muscularly built Hawaiian. The pilot came last. This is Camuela Memola, the skin diver I hired, Hank said, introducing the muscular young man. Just call me Sammy. That's what my Hawaiian name means. You got a job for me, the young man said. We sure have, Sammy, Mr. Brewster said. Right downstairs, he laughed. That line over the port side, Biff said, indicating the line, is our anchor rope. It's caught in the sunken sloop. Good, the diver said. Then there shouldn't be any trouble at all. He hopped back aboard the plane, dug around its cabin for a few minutes, then reappeared with his skin diving equipment. This consisted of a glass face mask and a small oxygen tank connected to his aqualung. Coming back on the easy action, he donned his equipment, touched his hand to his forehead in salute, and slipped overboard. Biff leaned over the gunwale. He saw the diver pulling himself downward, using the anchor rope to guide him. It was the same as climbing a rope hand over hand, only in reverse. Bubbles from the aqualung kept breaking the surface. Never thought of this, Hank, Tom said. No one told Sammy what to look for. Oh, yes, they did, Tom. Me, I did. On the way over, I couldn't give him much of a description. No, we don't have much to go on. Just some kind of metal box. That's what I told him. I imagine it's similar to the small locker box you keep semi-valuable papers in at home. That's what I told him, anyway. We ought to know soon. Air bubbles dotted the surface near the port side of the easy action. Five minutes went by, ten. At fifteen minutes, worry began to appear on the faces of those on board. Think anything could have happened to the diver, Tom Brewster asked. No, Dad. Not as long as those bubbles keep coming up regularly. He's all right. If those bubbles stop, we worry. After twenty minutes, Biff saw the anchor rope tighten, as if someone had pulled it from the other end. I think he's coming up, Biff said. Everyone leaned over the port side of the boat. Moments later, Sammy's wet head broke the surface. He wrenched the glass face mask from his head. Disappointment swept over the boat. The diver was empty-handed. End of chapter 21
Chapter 22 of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 22 Check Out. Don't look so worried, Sammy Momola said. The skin diver looked up at the disappointed faces. I didn't expect to bring up that box on my first dive. Give me a little more time. I do think I may have located it, though. Expressions of hope replaced the sad faces aboard the easy action. I need another tool, Sammy said, a short bar, two or three feet long. If what I think is the box, it's jammed and I can't free it without prizing it. What have you got? Sammy was treading water, one hand resting lightly on the yawl's gunwale. I look in the tool box, Biff said. While he was gone, Sammy told them what he had found below. That boat sure took a beating. Everything in the cabin is smashed up. She's filled with sand and other sea trash. I had to chase some fish out, too, especially a small octopus. Didn't want it squirting its ink around, clouding my vision. I found what I think may be your box under a mound of sand and broken seashells. Couldn't pull it out, though. Any sign of... No, Mr. Mahanelli, no sign of the poor fellow who went down with her. Biff had returned. Will this do? He held up a metal bar about three quarters of an inch thick and thirty inches long. It was used to turn the engine over if its electric starter didn't work. Just the thing. Sammy reached up for it. Well, here I go again. Maybe I'll have better luck this time. The divers submerged again. All had been so interested in the divers' activities and report that they hadn't noticed the Black Falcon. It was Lee who spotted Perez Soto's boat. Look, Dad, he called out. The Black Falcon had left its anchorage and moved over until it was only 200 feet from the easy action. Perez Sutter was watching every action aboard the yawl. Say one thing for that man, Tom Brewster said. He doesn't give up until the final chance is gone. If he sees us bring up that metal box, he'll still try to get it away from us somehow. I don't think he will, Hank Mahanelli said. What do you mean? Biff asked. You'll see, Hank Mahanelli smiled mysteriously. Another fifteen minutes went by. A steady stream of bubbles broke the surface. The diver was working. Thomas Brewster kept looking at his watch. Biff and Lee, lying on their stomachs, watched the area dotted with bubbles. Biff, looking up, noticed Madeira frantically winding up the anchor winch of the Black Falcon. Perez Soto was ready at the wheel, shouting at his henchmen to hurry up. "'Hey, look at that!' Biff exclaimed. "'Looks like Perez Soto has changed his mind. He's in a hurry to get out of here.' And he was. The anchor of the Black Falcon was barely out of the water when Perez Soto jammed the throttle of the cruiser full speed forward, and the boat leapt away, leaving a high foaming wake at its stern. Now I wonder what made him change his mind, Tom Brewster asked. I think I know the answer to that. Look over there, Hank Mahanelli said. They looked in the direction he was pointing. A low grey boat was coming along at a racing clip. Huge numbers on its bow identified it. It's the Coast Guard Cutter, Biff shouted. That's right, Biff. Now watch. We may see some fun. The cutter was after the Black Falcon. The cruiser was fast, but no match for the Coast Guard cutter. She closed the gap between the boats rapidly. Perez Soto wasn't giving up, however. He tried manoeuvring, swerving the Black Falcon from one direction to another on a zigzag course. The people on the easy action heard the boom of a small cannon. Looking at the cutter, they saw a puff of smoke from its forward gun. Then they saw a splash as a shell dropped just in front of the falcon's bow. If it doesn't heave to now, the next projectile will be directed at the ship, Mr. Mayor Nelly said. But Perez Soto had had enough. He heaved to. The cutter came alongside, and two ghost guards, guns in hand, boarded her. I imagine our troubles with Perez Soto are at an end, Mr. Mayor Nelly said. This is your doing? Tom Brewster asked. Hank nodded his head. Kidnapping. I reported Perez Soto as having kidnapped Dr. Weber. He'll be dealt with harshly. One witness against him will be Takawato. He's recovering. It was Perez Soto who gave him that stab wound. Well, you really did get around in Hilo, Mr. Mayanelli, Biff said. I don't like to leave any loose strings dangling. Incidentally, did Dr. Weber ever tell you how he happened to be abducted from his hotel room? Hank asked Tom Brewster. Yes, he did. He was talking to me when he felt a sharp point in his back. 
That was the call I took in Indianapolis, Biff. It was Perez Soto. With a sharp knife at his back and Perez Soto threatening to use the knife, there was nothing the doctor could do but obey instructions. They walked out of the porch entrance and through the garden to a waiting car. Madeira was the driver. Dr. Weber smiled at the group. Perhaps I should have resisted, but I knew Perez Soto meant what he said. I went along like a quiet mouse. An idea occurred to Biff. He dashed below. He was back in a moment. He held out his hand to Dr. Weber. I just remembered this doctor. It was the doctor's tobacco pouch and pipe. Bless you, my boy. Missing my pipe was the worst torture I endured during my entire captivity. A shout came from the side of the yawl. You people up there still interested in a metal box? It was the diver. Think this could be it? The Hawaiian diver held an oblong object above his head. Biff leaned over the side and took it from his hands. It was encrusted with barnacles, bits of shell and slimy green seaweed. It was a metal box. Biff handed it to his father. Get a screwdriver, Biff. We'll have to pry the lid open. Everyone watched tensely as Thomas Brewster worked the screwdriver under the lid of the box. A small lock held it shut. Finally, the lid sprang open. Inside was a loose, dust-like substance, hardened in spots where seawater had leaked in. There was also a damp piece of paper. This is it. It's got to be. Take a look, Dr. Weber. The doctor dipped his hand in the box. He fingered the powdery substance. He nodded his head. I can't tell you how this will run yet. I'll have to test it. But, well, I think we've really got something here. Thomas Brewster and Biff were poring over the map. The field's well marked. Won't be any trouble locating it if this sample proves out to be high grade. The doctor was looking at the pilot. Young man, could you fly me back to Honolulu? Sure, only take an hour or so. Well, Tom, I'd like to get back to my hotel. All my equipment is there. I can test this sample immediately. I want to. Is it all right with you, Henry, if I steal your plane and pilot? Certainly, Doctor. We'll all go back to Hilo by boat. Well, then, when you get there, look for a message from me. I'll have run my tests long before you get back by boat. Then I'm off. I'm due at an international scientific convention in Switzerland early next week. I'll have to leave Honolulu before you get back. The doctor shook hands all round. His last words to the group were, Thanks for my pipe, young man. Biff grinned in reply. It was hard to believe that this was the same old man who had been carried aboard not long ago. The doctor boarded the plane and in five minutes it was out of sight, winging its way to Hawaii. Tom Brewster took the tiller of the easy action. Lee was at the anchor winch, Biff at the mainmast and Hank Maynelli at the mizzen. Hoist away, Tom Brewster sang out as he felt the anchor pull free. Sails rattled up their masts. The wind caught them and the easy action was put on a course for Hilo. It was a pleasant sail. Everyone was relaxed. There was little conversation. All were happy to loll about the deck, resting from their recent near escapes from violence and storm. It was night by the time Mr. Brewster headed the yawl for a dock in Hilo Bay. The boat was tied up, and in half an hour the party entered their hotel. As good as his word, there was a message waiting from Dr. Weber. Sample proves out cesium in purest state discovered thus far in world. Looks like a sky-blue find. Tom Brewster handed the message to Biff. Biff read it and smiled at his father. Why sky-blue, Dad? Dr. Weber's mild little joke. Cesium means sky blue because that's how it shows up on a spectrum test. The boy and his father stood silent for a moment, enjoying this moment of complete peace. Dad, Biff said, this was supposed to be a vacation for Mum and the twins. Can we still make it one for the whole family? Have them fly over here and explore this beautiful island? Explore, Biff. Haven't you had enough adventures for now? I'll have them come over, but for the rest of our stay it's going to be nothing but fun and frolic. You agree? Check, Dad, check. End of chapter 22, recording by Peter Tomlinson End of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams